Are you intrigued by those who make the right choices to achieve success? Curious about what it is they know that makes them successful? What have they learned from their careers and life journeys? In his interviews with some of London's most authentic leaders, David C.M. Carter reveals secrets of success to inspire and motivate you to pursue your dreams. Insights from people of all backgrounds will empower you to get ahead. Change your mindset and begin your journey with this episode of Secrets of Success. In this special edition, we learn the importance of a positive outlook when attitude determines altitude. Trying to create memories, I'm trying to make it meaningful and impactful. I've learned that I can only be me because of the people that are behind me. Always follow your heart, follow your passion. I treat people the way I want to be treated. Help other people, be selfless. You should always be striving to be the best you can be. Don't just talk about it. Focus and execute. Execute, execute, execute. Being born into the circumstances I was born into. A motorcycle accident. Signing up with a trip to space. We were told on a daily basis that we could be the best people we could ever be. I was born to uh, mum and dad who were pretty ordinary people hard-working people, and I was one of six boys, so five brothers, living in a three-bedroomed terrace. But I don't, I don't want you to start crying here. I just, <laughs> I'm just telling you how it was. Living in a three-bedroom terrace house, uh, not far from Glasgow. And life didn't have a lot of material advantages, but it was happy. So I think that's, I'd have to def define that as pivotal because that definitely shaped me. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you, we learnt as lads, we learnt kind of the hard way that if it was something we wanted, we probably had to work very, very hard to get it. Probably school first. And which school? Do you mean junior school or senior, senior school. school? It was like experimental in that. This I didn't know any other school like this and none of my friends had n knew what a school mm -hmm. like this was. And when I went there I just felt it was just cool, I loved it and it was very disciplined and quite strict and like super academic but also sports focused. They really taught you you could be the best at whatever you did. There was all this thing about winning, it was so winning focused and it, it operated like a business obviously because it's a it was like an academy school. So there was a real emphasis on always being the best. I was the ubiquitous 17-year-old uh, motorcycling smelly week. And I seemed to be very happy. I was uh, always the last one to work and always the first one to leave. I was always the one that cabbed and, you know, cadged an extra 10 minutes on my uh, lunch break. Um, and, and unbeknown to me, actually, the day I had my motorcycle accident, I was going to get fired for all of the above. One would be um, Sudan, because it taught me a lot of things. It taught me um, dealing in Africa, dealing with governments, dealing with... When was this? This was in my mid-twenties. So in my mid-twenties... You were born there? No. I was financing... You grew up there? I was financing lots of different, uh, lots of different um, companies. I was situated in London and uh, a company approached me to finance their exploration in Sudan. I went to the Sudan and sat with the president of the Sudan and helped them negotiate route to keep the concession in the Sudan. There was oil there for sure, but getting it out was not going to be easy. I was on the phone to my mother and uh, she told me that she'd got breast cancer. Uh, and I was very sort of, didn't really know what to say. She's away in the Northeast and you know, my mother and I were very close. Uh, but I didn't respond in a very good way because I went down and had a few games of pool with a friend of mine. Uh, and then we ended up going out of the school grounds at that night and wandering down to the village. And we got into our heads, why had we did this? I do not know, but we got into our heads that we were going to take a car and we were going to go for a drive in it. And we, uh, 
wandered around Godalming, and we eventually came across a car that had the keys in the car. So we got in this car rather tremulously and turned the key. <laughs> but sadly. I want the people who work there to work there and come away having grown as grown professionally and hopefully grown as people to have great friends. To be inspired you've got to be receptive to it, you've got to have things to be inspired about, you've got to want to open your eyes to the possibilities of what other people are telling you. Uh, we drove this car rather nervously around the streets of Godalming. Uh, well, I didn't have my glasses with me, so I drove back to the drove back to the boarding house where we were where we were living, so I could go and get the go and get the glasses. But on the same time, that I think gave me a third year, so was, which basically was definitely my last chance, and I, I took it. So yeah, definitely yeah, that was um, a big um, a big moment. And that enabled you to go on and get the apprenticeship you wanted, and that yeah, at the place at the place I went when I was ten. You know, I walked in, I walked in and uh, well, I went to see them and I just said, okay, I'm ready. Uh, quite a bit of a European Oxbridge and it really sort of fast-tracked me from there. Uh, I loved studying there, I had a great time and I ended up uh, graduating six, six of my class, etc. So I really had a fantastic time. But it did fast-track me straight into the cabinet of the vice president of the European Union when Jacques Delors was president. So, so that sort of catapult, if you like, from mm. there was a, was a fantastic event. So parked the car at the end, which was stolen of course, uh, went up and got the glasses, jogged back down the, the road and whacked into the door, someone left the door open and there, holding the door open, was a policeman. What are you doing? And uh, <laughs> we've stolen this car and, you know, fair cop. I was in hospital and, and, and give or take for six months. Changed me completely because, you know, I, I, I you know, ceased to be the, uh, the man going to the party. So when I went back to work, instead of physically, you know, I was just sweeping up film and loading film and cutting up film and, you know, and getting it delivered and stuff like that. I couldn't do any of that because I couldn't really get around. So I sat on a, uh, on a seat which I find I'm incredibly good at. Um, and um, I uh, uh, started talking to people. So we had to go to court and we were prosecuted and, uh, and it was uh, an incredibly humbling experience because um, you can imagine the reaction of my family were very, very upset with me. Uh, for all the reasons you could imagine. Uh, the school, you know, my housemaster, who I was very, very close to, uh, he was, you know, felt betrayed, you know. Mm. They've given me this amazing chance that's so life-changing. Here I'm going around, sort of, almost like a cliche, a sort of poor boy from the north going around stealing cars. put an advert in the Wall Street Journal and it said British financier coming to New York looking for projects. He looked at me and the silence was just deathly. He said, you're serious, aren't you? Conscious thought came from somewhere and so I want to explore that. I think it's the biggest thing you can learn in your life. They put a hole in the ground in the first spot that, they, that Chevron's data told them where to put it and they hit a billion barrels of oil. I got a death threat from the South Sudanese rebels for financing that deal. I was front page news here in the UK. Um, they were serious, you know, the, the South Sudanese rebels who now are the South Sudanese government, who I also work for in other projects in the South, I'm still in the South and the North. Um, they were, they, they, they started a civil war. I mean, there was now something to fight over. So I'm in the detail, forgetting there is a big picture you know, this is a country that does not have any oil. 
there are consequences to everything you're doing and the consequences to something big are big. And that was the that was that was why it was a pivotal event. Late great Paul Raymond. My parents. Monsieur Le Grand, who was uh, my first uh, chef. My parents. And Rob, who's a plastic bag entrepreneur. I've worked with a lot of really smart people, and I've learnt a lot from many mm -hmm. of them. A secret trick that nobody else seems to play. I mean, I've had uh, advice of all sorts of incredibly impressive people. And in general, when I ask them about it, they say not many other people come to me. Oh yeah, I wrote that book 10 years ago, so no one really reads it anymore. So yeah, no one really comes along knocking on the door anymore. Monsieur Le Grand was the, uh, who took me as an, as an apprentice. I think for the first time in my whole life, and at that stage, I got someone who really you know, took me under their wings and really look after me and you know, give me direction as well, which I don't think I was getting enough at, uh, at college. The funniest thing he ever did with me, which is a strange mentoring conversation, was he turned up um, <coughs> at my, one of my first businesses and the first Gulf War had started and it was snowing. And he was your landlord? He was my landlord. Everybody went there from George Clooney to Madonna. It's that talking about yourself makes gives you a self-realization. I strongly believe that you should have an element of a heart in your head, otherwise there's no point to do it. There's no point to go out and make money. And I was sitting in my office, I don't know, reading Men Only or something, because it was that quiet. And my Spanish partner said, oh, Mr. Fuller, he said, he said, Mr. Raymond, he come, he come to see you. So I went upstairs and there was Paul and he was looking at the menu. And I said, hi, Paul, how are you? And he shook my hand and we sat down and he said, um, he said, is there any waitress, uh, waiter server here? And I said, I'll go to the bar and get you a drink. He said, no, I'm quite capable of doing that. And he got up and he, he said, I would like a large Remy Martin, double, and the barman said, thank you, sir. He, he said, I said, Paul, let me buy that too. He said, no. I said, please let me buy that too. He said, if you insist on buying this drink, he said, I shall walk out and I shall never talk to you again. So the barman said, what do I do, Mr. Fuller? I said, take his money. We uh, lived on an industrial estate, or ne near to an industrial estate owned by my grandfather and then my father, Nami. And um, everyone that worked there knew my father and everyone that worked associated with all of the businesses inside that industrial estate knew my father and my grandfather. And they all had one thing in common, which was they loved my dad. If you think that, you know, the person who ran the England rugby team would be a really interesting person to talk to about your local rugby team, you might be surprised how they would actually answer your email and give you a bit of their time, especially if you asked the questions in an interesting way and did something trying to help them back in some way. So it's it is astonishing how incredibly helpful people are. So I think the way I've learnt is as much from people doing it in an appallingly bad way. I'm not going to name and shame, but I have worked with some people who have taught me a lot about how not to do it. He sat down and he asked me an awful lot of questions about the area, which now I know that he clearly knew the answer to. Um, and I answered all the questions clearly correctly. And he said, you can't pay your rent. And I went, oh, yes, I can. I was a big party next Tuesday. So he says, you're not listening to me. He said, I can see how many people are in here. It's January. You can't pay your rent. Oh, yes, I can. He said, listen, you're not listening to me. You can't pay your rent. And I said, well, what do I do if I can't? He said, don't. And he drank his drink and he left. And a few weeks later, I couldn't pay my rent, and I phoned him up, and I said, Paul, you're absolutely right, I can't pay my rent. He said, why? Why are you calling me? And I said, um, because I can't pay my rent. He said, I told you what to do, just don't, and put the phone down. He was very fair about the way he did business with them, and they all said great things about him. And so I, I understood, I learned very quickly that you need to interact with even people, you know, on the, on the ground, the workers, people really putting the effort in mm -hmm. down on the ground. You mustn't forget those people because they're very, very important.
I try to steal ideas from... I'm going to steal ideas from you, David. I'll take ideas from anybody that I think are good and that I can apply. And I will eject anything that I think is, is nonsense. I think that's helped to shape me. Well, I feel like I've benefited massively in my own life from getting all sorts of brilliant advice from people, so I'm, I like to give back. What's more, the funny thing is, it's amazing how when you give back, shortly afterwards other things start happening which are good for you as well. I used to go for Christmas lunch with him and John James, who now runs the, really very well the very company, and his, uh, his, his uh, uh, granddaughter has fallen in India, who are my godchildren. Um, and he used to say, I'm going for a walk. Every time I arrive, he said, I'm going for a walk. And he never walked. And he would go out onto the drive, and he would come back and say to John, uh, that red Alfa Romeo that's out, that Mark's got outside, um, it's new, isn't it? And John would go, no, he's had that for years, this, that, the other. And then everything would continue. So all he wanted to do, and this is the, this is the bizarre mentoring of it, he gave me a very relevant point that, you know what, people will do you favours, they will mentor you and everything else, but if you take the piss. I realised very quickly how lucky I was with, um, uh, to have picked that patisseries and him, because um, you, know, you did three weeks at work, and one week you went to college. So during that week at college, I will meet all the other apprentices. And most of them, I would say probably 60% of them, were doing nothing. So they were like peeling apples all day. Some were like uh, cleaning the washing up. Some were serving mm -hmm. in a shop. Some were in the country estate of the, uh, of the boss mourning the loan. But it was almost like a ridicule. They would come and said, you know, you almost cure my demons because by baking, you know, now instead of, um, you know, taking pills instead when I feel down, I bake a cake. My legacy will be hopefully on my grave, he baked great cakes. We used to meet, you know, once a month at, during that week and those people did nothing. And I was completely the opposite. I was like, you know, it was actually every morning. Okay, come go, here. go, go. Come here, we're going to show you that. Every time it was something new. And it wasn't just him, it was the whole team. He used to have a lot of um, drivers working for him. And even if they fiddled a little bit of, little bit of diesel money, he would, he would know it, but let them get away with it. So, you know, it's five pounds, it makes them happy. Leave it alone. It's, it's, he, he knew where the balance was. Empathy, sensitivity. Fairness and honesty, generosity. Integrity. Integrity and belief. Amazing what happens when you give people a chance. Decision involves my three system, the three column system, which is my left column, my receiving. I have a big desire, otherwise I wouldn't have done the things I wanted to do in life. You have to have a desire. And you have to restrict that desire because if you just receive or you just take, then you're out of balance, obviously. If you just give, you're out of balance, obviously. So you have to receive, you can't give what you don't have. So you must receive and you must give, but you must balance it and your center is very important. So my email, exam for example, is central column. Why? Because I want to remind myself every day on every email I receive that I must stay in my center. I must restrict restrict and center this so that I can live by that principle of it must all be receiving, giving, centered. I think that you should enjoy yourself, right, okay? I think you should do it with some form of integ integrity that is specific to you. Doesn't necessarily mean that, ev that everybody thinks that you have an integrity. Uh, and, and personally, I rest a lot better um, having done something honestly and wisely, or as honest as you can in business, and I mean, I'm, as I say, you know, I'm happier making 50p and feeling that I've done it in the right way than making a pound and perhaps being a little bit too sharp for my own good. I think the most important thing for me is not to give people things they don't need, not to sell them things they don't need, not to market things they don't need. Which is the best argument wins? It has to be the argument that wins, not the 
person that wins. Summing around empathy and sensitivity, people, because that's a very important value to me. Uh, right alongside that would be honesty, fairness. Uh, I really do believe in fair play and people being honest and open with each other. You learn quite a bit about surviving in that kind of environment. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to keep giving it my absolute best. Now, businesses can perform beyond their scale. They can, there's nothing to stop them aping the behaviours of businesses a thousand times their size. I value generosity not just my generosity, but the generosity of others. I think it's a great thing for people who can be generous. And generous doesn't mean to say they've got necessarily high material worth to mm -hmm. give away. Just how they give what they have to give, whether it's just their feelings, emotions, or their love. The more you can give someone a chance, it's amazing how often people come good on you. Whether it's a promotion to someone that may be too young, mm -hmm. or too old, or too something, but that's often worked out well. Or just to point out that people can make a mistake and still come good, you know, you don't have to overreact each time. It really stresses me out how many messages there are for advertising and marketing related to things that we don't actually need that you're kind of tricked into thinking you do. Uh, acceptance, obviously, as well. Uh, that's very important. Um, for many, many things, you know. Uh, Tell me more about acceptance. Religions, uh, what do you call that, sexual orientations, um, political views, anything, you know, I think, you know. So tolerance, do you mean? Yeah, tolerance and accepting people for what they, uh, for what they are. When things all come together, and it's great, Bring a really tough problem I've been wrestling with for a while. I'm in the zone 365 days a year. The zone is is very elusive. It's for me if I'm in the zone, it's brilliant. But it's elusive. There's, it's not about if I eat pasta, I'm in the zone. It's very hard for me to to pinpoint what it is that helps me get into the zone. If you do things you're passionate about, you are in the zone because you thrive on it. It's what you want to do. It's your ambition, it's your drive. When I'm in that zone, things drop into place, everything works, it's water. Um, it flows. It flows perfectly. And I'm in a zone now at this moment, in this phase, I'm in a zone. And um, coming across you when I've decided to do what I'm doing and this dropping into place, that's the flow. That's, you meet the right people, the people that you need drop into place and everything seems to be on a good path. For me, feeling in a zone is about I'm doing something which I enjoy doing, I'm competent in doing it, so I feel confident about it, and maybe I'm, I'm adding value. I, I can actually, at the end of a day, I can think, yep, I helped that person, I solved that situation, mm -hmm. I cracked that problem. You know when a kind of quack preacher like gives some delivery and then falls to the ground from exhaustion from the spirit <laughs> massively self-aware and I'm also self-reflecting all the time Anything that's not like me is interesting. If, if you hang around people who are like you, who eat the same food, listen to the same music, go to the same clubs, it's too safe. I'll sit in the most boring little room, like the most depressing little room, and I'll give all this gold out, and it's amazing, and it feels so good. And it's like a drug. 
because then at the end you have a come down and it's exhausting. I'm like, oh my God, I've given everything away right now. I'm really tired. I need to just lie. I can do quite a lot of things in a short space of time. Things seem to, you know, to manifest quite quickly when you're well in the zone, they can manifest very quickly. And a lot of people can look at something I've done and say, how on earth did you do that so quickly? Well, I didn't, I've been just planning it well. Tesla used to do it in his mind. He would plan something in his mind and build a machine in his mind and then turn it on in his mind and watch it running and say, oh yeah, that's not gonna work, is it? And so he would rebuild it again in his mind and then rebuild it again in his mind until he turned it on, it ran perfectly and then he would go build it. And if you do that, or a level of that, mm -hmm. you know, if you, if you plan that way and, and spend time creating time in your meditation or your quiet time, then you can actually achieve a great deal more than running around like a headless chicken and trying to physically figure it all out. So yeah, I, I do meditate and I do find time to make sure I'm still and conscious. But for me, normally I've had to have a period of torpor before I've got, oh, I can't do it, I'm stuck. I'm, I'm having to sit at the, I'm forcing myself to sit at the desk or I'm forcing myself to do whatever it is I'm gonna do. Eventually, ah, this is, this is an issue. And then you, you no, know, it feels like you can work for a week without, without stopping, because you just, you know, just, you know, you're thinking something through, well, oh, I'm gonna put this guy out all day and make it all happen. And therefore, as a human being, try to make as much of your life in the zone as possible. Make the zone fill up as much as possible, because you'll become very successful in the zone, because you love it. I don't know, you know what? I, have to, I do have to get in the zone, for sure. Are you in the uh, zone in your life at the moment? Oh, without a doubt. So what does being in the zone mean to you? It just means being switched on, being thoughtful. But yeah, the zone is re really important, but finding it is difficult. But then if you go back to the luck question, you reap what you sow. So if you reap good zone, you'll get good zone. And do you think it also ties back to the attitude and altitude question in that if you've got the right attitude, you're more likely to be in the zone than not. Yeah, definitely. You have to aim high to stay high. You can't climb that mountain without thinking you can. Attitude means everything. The sky is no limit. Your attitude means a lot when it comes to altitude. How high can you jump? How high can you soar? The, mental the mentality, the way you think about it, has a huge impact. Most things that people want require the application of effort over a sustained period of time. The right attitude will bring you up instead to bring you, um, to bring you down. I know that my attitude has gotten me to where I am and it will continue to support and hold and guide me throughout the rest of my life. If you put the red rope of the VIP, you, you see, you remember that I come from nightclub stuff. Oh, the red ropes. The red rope, <laughs> the red rope, right? The red rope that will not allow you in. If you aim it there, you will achieve there. If you aim it very high, you will achieve somewhere in the middle. So you have to aim as high as you possibly can. I believe that when you raise the bar really high, to the point where the people around you say, that's too high, you're in good territory. Your ceiling is there. Well, you might get there or you might get close to it, but you sort of capped what you can achieve. If you say there is no ceiling or the sky is the ceiling, then everything is possible. So I went to Star City, did my centrifuge training, um, I went up in the Illusion in 76 and did weightlessness training. A job offer from uh, President Bill Clinton to join him in the White House. Always have a mentality of thinking out of the box. Follow your heart, follow your passion, have fun, and you will achieve great many heights. It's okay to think big. And I think by having the sky truly being no limit, mm -hmm. you have a mentality where, where you basically say, nothing is impossible. I've always had the mentality that I am a winner and that 
I deserve what I work for. Um, and that, to have the confidence to accept it. Your attitude is very important, but it needs to be you. It needs to be you through and through. It needs to be the attitude you have at home and the attitude you have with somebody on the street and the attitude you have in business. Even if you fail, even if you're not good at something, or even if you, you know, if you're still a good person and if you've got a good attitude as you go along, you will, you will create success around you or support around you. I started off simply. Uh, I, I wasn't a hugely bright individual. I didn't come out as with a first from some great university. Positive thinking has helped me get where I am today. If your attitude is real, meaning your attitude is you, um, because you can have an attitude that's not you, you're putting an attitude on, mm -hmm. um, then it can determine a safe altitude. If your attitude is fake, then your, attitude, your altitude is dangerous. And I've been both, so I know from experience. Attitude does determine, in my mind, it does determine altitude. There are sections of society who are positive and there are sections who are negative and there's lots in between. I've got a, a, like a detector, a built-in positiveness detector, and I seek out people who have huge belief in what it is they're doing. That doesn't mean to say, by the way, they're big ego. You've got to have the attitude in order to succeed at most things worth succeeding at. And it's true, if you're married, you're other important. You know, if you want, in my case, I really want to be a really great father for my kids. I want my kids to have great childhoods and to remember their lives, great happiness when they look back at upon their childhood. Well, that, that's a nice desire, but you know, if your attitude is real, you've got to actually put your money where your mouth is. You've got to spend the time, you've got to do the things, you've got to make sacrifices to the, you know, you've got to make sacrifices to other things that at the time are convenient or nice for you to do. And if you don't do those things, you won't achieve your, the success I hope to have with that one. All the press in the world means nothing if you haven't got the actual goods to back it up. I try to encourage people to give off the very best of themselves, to throw away the props and the crutches, and to just be as positive as they can in the way that they express themselves and approach situations. Because people who do that, in my experience, they are more likely to do well in everything, and they're more likely to be happier. If you open your arms out to the universe, it will, like, things will happen for you. Where people are more likely to communicate with you, to talk with you and be open with you if you're not placing yourself above them. If anything, you're almost placing yourself below them. The countdown has started. We only on this planet, on average, 75, 80 years or something like that. And every single day, we are chopping off a little bit. Money d doesn't need to be sitting there, it needs to be at work. And it's wrong to have it sitting there. It's weakness and it's, it's, it's fear. If you're just collecting it and keeping it, you need to be putting it at work and that's confidence. For a business, success to me is having the perfect balance of creativity and commercial success. You should make the most of what you've got. You should mm -hmm. try and uh, have as big a life as you can and be as good as you can. Because if you want things, you will attract them. I mean, you're a very attractive man, Edward. Oh. I, knew, I knew that there was another reason. <laughs> Our youngsters do not have to be bright, gifted graduates to make a positive contribution to enterprise. Once they think they can do it, then technically nothing's stopping them. Don't let egos, including your own, get in your way. If you're afraid of the deep ocean um, and you stay close to the shore, then you'll never get there. You can reach for the stars you, you could do 100 years ago, 50 years ago, 30 years ago when I was really entering business and you still can. It's there for the taking. Mm -hmm.